regardless of climate change, helping people to understand how to stay in control of their emotional mind, not, not, not dismiss it, but stay in control of it, allow it to happen, but understand it and be in control of it. And then let your rational thinking and your actions be guided by your intellect and your rational mind. And that's kind of the, that's a big, a big journey for me throughout my career, really. But obviously it's really come to a fore in the last few years while I've been really thinking about it myself. Um, and it's, it's a fascinating field of, of research that I, I know a lot of people, psychologists in particular, um, delve into. And, uh, and that is a challenge that if we can get that across to more people, then I think it'll help us with the communication process. Dave Borlase is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by Innovators Magazine and 1.5 Media. Born just four months before man first landed on the moon back in 1969, Dave has been conscious of environmental issues since studying for a technology degree with the Open University in the late 1990s. In early 2017, Dave read a seminal book called A Farewell to Ice, written by the Arctic research scientist, Professor Peter Wadhams. That book was an epiphany that set Dave off on a quest to create climate communication videos that aim to decode the sometimes overwhelmingly complicated and confusing scientific information around climate change with the objective of explaining the concepts in the sort of plain English that everyday folks can understand. He does it so well. His YouTube channel, Just Have a Think, now has one over 100,000 subscribers through his weekly videos. Dave seeks to understand the issues that face our civilization in the 21st century and focuses on the potential solutions that will save as many lives as possible and hopefully bring about a greater level of equality in the world. You can visit Just Have a Think channel on YouTube as well as support Dave through his Patreon site, Just Have a Think. Dave, Thank you so much for being here. I could go on and on about your biography and past, uh, but I want to get into that as we, we speak today. You give us a little behind the scenes look at how your journey has been. Welcome. Thank you, Mark. Great to be here. So not only do you have over 100,000 subscribers, but you have wonderful video that says nature has learned how to eat our plastic it has about a million views congratulations it's a wonderful video nuclear fusion revolutionary new breakthrough has about four hundred and twelve thousand views also amazing one of my favorites is the one on water and meat where you actually give us a little clip and you go out to your uh, garden or your backyard and you start hauling in water and showing us, you know, how much water is in chicken embedded in chicken, how much water is embedded in sausages, et cetera. Fabulous amount of work, but just amazing results on what a well-produced video. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, that's very kind of you to You're say. You're setting the yeah. example and a lot of people are, are, are noticing and coming to you for for these type of things. I believe we're aligned in many things uh, regarding climate and the 21st century, the road that we're going. So we're gonna have a lot of opportunities to go down some rabbit holes into a deeper dive dialogue. Mm -hmm. And that's really my hope today. I don't wanna tickle or scratch the surface too much. I really wanna <laughs> get in behind the scenes, you know, pull back the curtain and see your journey. That brings me to the first question you started with a book, but how did that journey go? And I, and I see the evolution a little bit because I've watched the videos, but can you give us a little insight of, of how that went? Yeah. Someone said um, that once you know these things, you can't unknow them. And I think that's probably a good summary of where I, where I, where I started and where, why I'm continuing really. So, so I did the degree in the nineties with the open university. That was a technology degree. Even back then we were looking at renewable energy in those days, wind was, was kind of where it was at and, and we studied it, um, the Danish um, example of, of the way the Open University put it was really trying to teach us how 
uh, that all solutions aren't necessarily final and complete and they, they can't be brought to governments or corporations as perfect entities. They have to be developed. And the, the great example was in the early 70s, we had the oil crisis, as you know, and the wind power was offered to the United Kingdom as a great opportunity because we're the windiest country in Europe and it was the obvious thing to do. Um, and because it was in its nascency and, and it wasn't fully developed and because the UK government had just discovered North Sea oil, of course, they rejected wind out of hand and just went full on into the North Sea. The Danes had a similar opportunity and, in, and they understood that it wasn't a completely finished article and they divul divul divulged it, um, I think that's the right word, to their farmers. They, they basically said to their farmers, look, you've all got sort of windmills of some sort, develop them and see what you can come up with. We'll put a centre of excellence in Copenhagen, bring your ideas to the centre of excellence and, and we'll see if we can build an industry out of it, which is exactly what they did. And by the time I was studying for a degree in 1996, the Danes had cornered the wind market. It was worth about four billion pounds, I think, in those days, 20 odd years ago, 25 years ago. And so that taught me something at a very young age about, about, you know, not necessarily looking for perfect solutions, but getting something and working with it. And then, so I was interested in solar more recently. I'd bought a house 10 years ago or so, and uh, I've got this cabin that I'm sitting in now. This is where I do all the videos and all the work. And I, I wanted to put some solar on here to make it a bit more sustainable and to learn about, you know, solar installation. And, and I'm a bit of a you know, gadget boy anyway. So I wanted to get my hands into the wires and find out how it all works and how to convert 12 volts from AC into DC or DC into AC and inverters and all that. So I put that on the cabin. And while I was researching for how to do that, that led me towards, you know, how the internet takes you down all sorts of rabbit holes. And that's how I found the book from Peter Wadhams. Um, so what I thought at the time, I thought, well, climate change is happening and it's apparently a little bit of a problem and it'd be quite nice if I put some solar panels on my roof and wouldn't that be that probably be about as much as I need to do by the time I'd done research and then by the time I'd finally re read the whole of Peter Wadden's book I was like oh my god we are really in trouble in a way that I had no idea really no and I thought of myself as a fairly well-informed kind of guy I had no idea of the magnitude of the trouble that we're in and as I say, once you know that, you can't unknow it. And so that really um, pushed me on. And so I wanted, then I, then I wanted to start talking about it. I'd reached a, the age of nearly 50. I'd done kind of 30 odd years in, in a career. I'd done my striving to do, you know, corporate stuff. And, and I felt I'd reached a point where I could start saying useful things and talking in a useful way. And I'd, uh, most of my working life had been managing people, understanding what makes people tick and and looking at good managers and bad managers and and i'd learned quite early on that that you know to get people to to do things you know, obviously you have to tell them what to do and you have to tell them how to do it but you really need to tell them why and and that's that third thing is missed by so many managers they just say this is what you need to do and this is how you need to go do it now you know go away and do it and don't come back till it's finished not a good way to manage people not a good way to get people to do stuff unless they understand why they're probably going to either not do it at all or do it in a half hearted way. So I wanted to produce videos that tried to explain why, obviously the what and the how, but why we need to do these things. And in words that, that, as you said earlier, words that people like me can understand. And I, so I read through these so many scientific papers and I, there were weeks when I was almost in tears with, you know, trying to understand these papers or just trying to bring out of these papers the salient information that you can give to a member of the public in 30 seconds or a few minutes in a reasonably engaging and entertaining way that will keep their attention and help them understand the point because they're never going to trawl through a thousand pages of a scientific peer-reviewed report with all the technical language that you've got to go and look up and understand people aren't going to do that so that was really that was the mission nice short sharp videos 10 to 15 minutes hopefully in length engaging little bit of video work and animation hopefully a fairly upbeat um, optimistic and sometimes humorous um, presentation from me and you know maybe it'll work and, and I just started. You did a fabulous job that's really turned out to be something and I know 
you you kind of touched upon it that there's been an evolution or a journey there that, uh, for example, I'll give you the, the example most recent. You just released um, a video on Sunday, or was it Saturday, Sunday? And yesterday. you had, yeah, yesterday, you had to um, read, I think there was a minimum four reports that are major reports, and they're between 70 and 200 pages long, some of those mm -hmm. reports. And uh, they're very complicated, very scientific, very, a lot, a lot of things in there. I've also read the reports, but that is a lot of work. And then to summarize that, to get it into a, a executive summary, something that's understandable is extremely hard and complex to do. But I think if I'm wrong, can you tell us a little bit more about the the journey. So you started out and you're like, Oh no, I'm, I'm getting into a rabbit hole. I've just read this book. Now I want to do a video. This is extremely complicated. And then as I watch your videos over time, they just, it's actually, it's just not only did the videos get better, the producing and the quality of the post-production and animation, but the content and the, the, mm -hmm. the, you know, did you use tools like critical thinking, systems thinking, uh, sense making? What can you give us that more insight on that? How you evolved, and what maybe some aha moments or some specific videos that you did say, "Wow, this is one of my favorite. I learned the most ever there." Yeah, I mean, the the first few videos were really just the the intention was for folks to come along with me on my journey from relative ignorance through to knowing a little bit more. And it was really, I suppose the real idea was what can I do in my life to affect change? And, and what can I change in my lifestyle to try and reduce my carbon footprint and make myself a bit more environmentally um, friendly, if you like. So that was the first few videos. Um, and the, in, from a production point of view, it was, it was just, that was really, I, I figured the first year would be my apprenticeship on, on uh, learning how to, you know, make videos. I'd used Adobe Photoshop and, um, and Premiere Pro and After Effects a little bit for work in the past. So I kind of had a, a, a passing acquaintance with them, um, uh, but not much more than that. So, so I was learning how to use the, the tools of the trade, if you like. And you'll see that if you watch all the videos, you'll see a progression from, you know, uh, quality, the production standards, as you say, have, have generally improved um, more and more. And as I've got better equipment, better camera, um, you know, that's, that's improving all the time. But the, the, the journey, the transition from what can I do in my own personal life through to the realization that it was, a, it was a bigger, more global issue. And I needed to, I felt I needed to start talking about more global issues, particularly collective action um, and pressuring governments to start to put incentives and stimulus, carrot and stick, if you like, to be more proactive um, in the world. I was seeing that more and more of that as I, as I went to it. It coincided quite nicely with the, you know, XR and Greta came along in, in 2018. So I started in 2000, early 2018. And then those movements began not long after that. So I think public awareness was already being picked up by those people as well. Um, and I went, I went and followed the XR occupation of London um, last April. Um, and that was a very interesting experience. And that, you know, that showed me a lot about the power of collective activism. Two, two weeks after that event, the, the XR people were in a room with Michael Gove, who's the UK, who was the UK Environment Secretary and his team. And he was asking them what it was they wanted to see the government do. And, and some of their demands he, he met, declaring a climate emergency is a good start. At least it's a public declaration. So I saw all that happening. And so that, that's kind of led me more and more towards videos about um, more global things, technological and, and not so much political, but collective act and action, if you like, you know, um, getting people to get up and stand up and do something. Um, and so there's been, there were more and more at the end of the videos, there were, there were more and more sort of just brief summaries from me that talked about, you know, this isn't just a video for you to watch and a bit of eye candy. It's you can do something here. Um, and if you, you know, if you feel you can interact in any way in your local environment or, or whatever you can do, don't sit by and watch it happen because it's happening now, get up and do something. So, so it sort of, it drove me, me, my, my, ambition to drive others kind of drove me as well at the same time um in terms of um 
I don't know whether there are any seminal videos. I did interview Peter Wadhams. I did. I did. I went to see him at Cambridge in his offices, and I cut that into four videos. Um, and he spoke very eloquently, um, very compellingly about the issues, not just in the Arctic, which, which are, of course, very uh, grievous, but uh, about the implications of what's happening in the Arctic for the rest of the world, including particularly down in the mid latitudes. We spoke a bit about um, famine and hunger and and, uh, and floods as well. And that's going to affect those regions more than anywhere else in the world. And that was a learning curve for me as well. So that opened my mind a little bit to it's not just putting solar panels on your roof or getting wind power in your country. It is the entire global interlinked system that we've got now particularly with with getting food and products from one place to another is really destroying huge swathes of of very complex and fragile and vulnerable ecosystems and biodiversity in ways that you know you just we just don't seem to understand and appreciate as human beings because we've got away with it for so long it's inconceivable to us that we can't keep going away with it some people still don't think it's possible for the human being to have an a sufficiently large impact on the planet that we would, you know, that we could start destroying things, which of course is completely wrong. So, um, so I think that's, that's been my journey from what can I do as an individual to what, what we can all do. Uh, I'm just a drop in the ocean, but we all constitute, we're all drops and the oceans are made out of drops and we all make up an ocean. So that's kind of been the journey, if you like. Thank you. Yes, I, I see that journey and that, that's why I wanted to ask about it. I also see that it's not just you reading the reports and the light going on with you. You're actually installing the solar panels. You're out saying, okay, how much physical water does it take to put into these chi this chicken I'm going to get ready to grill? And you put that in a video. And so that where possible, I mean, nuclear fission, you're not building a reactor or anything in your backyard, but you're trying where possible to um, build that sustainable, that resilient lifestyle. You're also, you know, changing different things that you read and you say, okay, how, how can I apply that to little old me, my life and, and into my situation now where possible and if not, what do I need to do to maybe get a further step in the right direction? And I, I see that kind of with, I, I look at your videos with a different lens, so to say. And so I, I definitely see that. And I, I really like that. And that's uh, what I also hear, heard with you just r telling us kind of behind the scenes how it's developed. That goes into what we've just experienced this whole pause, this pandemic, the COVID-19, the Black Lives Matter, the, the unrest, the kind of crazy distancing and, and things that we're still experiencing around the world and to some extent haven't fully come out or don't know if we're going into a second mm -hmm. wave. But I want to know by having the sustainability mindset by having a little bit of resilience, those things that you've learned over the past two years or more, or since you've done this, well, it's four years now almost, hasn't it been? Nearly, yeah. Yeah, so um, has that helped you weather this time a lot better, be more prepared and feel like, wow, okay, and, and tell us how and why, what, what, how, how has it looked for you? Well, it's an inter it's a good question and it's an interesting one. And I think the two things do do cross over climate change, if you like, and, and, and living more sustainably and this pandemic. They do cross over. And I, I suppose one before I say, but one caveat I would interject just right here is that I, I do take care not to be. I don't want to sound like, you know, well, well these things I've done, aren't I? You know, the great I am. So that, that's not how I, I intend my messages to come across. And I hope they don't come across that way. But the fact remains I have made quite a lot of changes in my life that have actually ironically been quite useful in the pandemic so for example seven years ago I stopped driving a car I don't have a vehicle um, uh, a long time ago I stopped drinking alcohol when I was 35 stopped smoking when I was 30 um, three years ago I went vegetarian and then about six months later I went vegan <clears throat> excuse me and again not because I not because I have a passionate uh, uh, abhorrence of, of, of man eating flesh. I understand a lot of vegans do, and that's their motivation. And I, 
I, I, I'm not a big fan of killing animals. I, I've now learned that there's no need for an animal to die for me to eat and be sustained. So I'm more, pra I'm more practical, if you like. I, I looked at the land use of, of, um, of animal livestock farming in the world, uh, the big agribusinesses I'm talking about. Not, I'm not talking about small holdings up in Aberdeen or somewhere. The big agribusinesses. And I thought that, you know, I don't need to be part of that. And that's, so that's why I went vegan and I found it was really easy to do and made me feel more healthy so um those sacrifice not sacrifices those changes that I made in my life I made because I wanted to not because anyone told me I had to um solar and wind or solar power certainly on my house has been a help so in the pandemic little things like um uh the the lack of mobility that has been inflicted upon us um, and you're not supposed to drive, you know, long distances to do any this, that, and the other. Well, I wasn't doing that anyway because I'd got used to a lifestyle that was slightly more constrained. Um, now I haven't got kids, so I don't need to take the kids to school. I understand some people have need to have a way of doing that. I, I get that, but in my life, uh, I, I'd learned how to live in a much more constrained way. I, I walk once a week. I walk to the supermarket, which is a mile uh, from my house, with a buck with a backpack. And I, I buy, you know, uh, food as environmentally as environmentally sustainable as you can from a supermarket, I guess. But it's vegan food, so it tends to be quite well sourced. And I try to buy food that's sourced in this country rather than flying it in from all over the world. Fill up my backpack and I walk home. And that's good exercise. So that keeps me fit. Um, I'm not using a vehicle. Um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not even using public transport in that respect. And in the pandemic, that I've been able to just continue that way of life nothing i haven't really had to amend anything in my life um to cope with the pandemic so it hasn't been a wrench you know like i think it perhaps has for some people um and i think the pandemic shows us that living more within your means and a more contained lifestyle is how we will need to live in the future we just will i mean we can start getting used to it now in our generation and, and maybe the generation after us or the world will change to such an extent that these, the ability to live in a less constrained way won't be there because nature will have done the job for us. So that's kind of the choice, we, in my opinion, that's kind of the choice we've got. So that I think what the pandemic, I think, is starting to sow that seed of thought in a lot of people's minds. Um, and that can only be a good thing. So, so I was lucky in a way that I'd already kind of maybe started on a little bit of that journey. And I hope a lot more people are beginning to think about it in that sense now as well. Well, I, I really figured that you weren't out hoarding toilet paper or disinfectant or... Um, no, I've not know, been off, injecting the... Uh... <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> out um, doing the mask making craze. I, uh, there, there's a unique thing that happens when you start to think more sustainable. You also usually start to live more sustainable and apply the things that you see because you see that they're a little bit better operating system that there. it's more efficient it's nicer uh, you feel more secure there's a little bit more resilience there i had the opportunity to interview um, an oxford professor from jesus college i believe it uh, is where he teaches uh, mm -hmm. tomas david barrett and he does a show called the human beasts and in one episode of his his uh show he he interviews a zoo designer that does big zoos and they were calling our homes and places we live these human zoos and when you you have the sustainable or resilient mindset if you're already thinking in that way you tend to have the technologies the innovations the things in place where you live to make it comfortable, to make it efficient, to make it so that you can sustain yourself. And so your home human zoo actually is, is a place you feel comfortable to do your work and live. And, and, and you know, there's some cartoons out there that are really funny. So I can't remember, do I uh, work from home or is this my, you know, uh, or is this my office? Am I at the office? I can't, you know, distinguish the two. Yeah. And um, it's really, kind of a construct of how we design our lives. And I think uh, from what I've seen from your videos, there's the evolution and not only how, what you explained in the beginning, it's you've created a nice place and a nice system so that you have a little bit more 
resilience than others. And, and that's really what I hope to hear because the, the biggest um, cause for people not to transition or to move to something as they think it's hard or it's difficult or they don't understand it or it's scary or costs a lot. And uh, in the long run, it's actually just a much better system. And so I see that with you and, and uh, I, I heard it in your response. And so that's uh, very beautiful. That was my first question and, and really kind of for the listeners to see what, what, how do other people do it? Because some people that I know really never applied it. They talked about it a lot, didn't apply it, and they were the ones out holding toilet paper. They didn't know what to do. Yeah. They didn't have the technologies ready to be able to work from home or to, to survive. They, and so well, it's it, good to uh, have that. That speaks to the, I didn't mention it then, but we can perhaps get into it as well, is, is the, the, the system thinking, the, the, the fast and slow thinking, or I, I sometimes call it the emotional mind and the intellectual mind. And the emotional mind is the knee-jerk reaction to what's in front of you, which is the people buying dozens and dozens of toilet rolls. They just reacted. Didn't, they didn't show any acumen for projecting forward with their intellectual, rational mind as to, well, do I really need 157 toilet rolls? Mm. You know that they just reacted, and and so that's perhaps something we can we can delve more into because it's an inter it's a very interesting area, and I think it's one of the reasons why climate change is so difficult to communicate because we're talking to people who generally do use their emotional mind, and not the slow intellectual rational system to critical thinking. I suppose you might say to project forward into into the consequences that of their was my today. next question so we could dive into it right right now <laughs> it was about critical thinking and and you know I, uh, for me for example i'm not worried if there was a shortage of toilet paper I, I have a bidet i have a way to do it i can use rainwater recycling or other methods uh, a little five euro adapter to the toilet and i can have a bidet you know and and yeah uh, try to think differently of, you know, how to do it. And it's not going back to Neanderthal times. It's actually thinking just, you know, how, how can I be a little self-sufficient? And so, yeah. but that's a, a, a paradigm shift, a mindset, a critical a way of critically thinking of the situation you're in instead of hitting that doom and gloom of panic or hoarding mode, you, you mm. think different. So mm. let's go down that rabbit hole because I'd like to hear more what you've discovered sure. and heard. So, um, um, sorry, are you going to, do you want to start with the question or, or do you? Yeah, go ahead. I mean, you, I can start it with a question or you can go ahead and, and jump right in. Okay. I can stop it either. Okay. What, what are your um, thoughts? Because you were actually started to go that way and then maybe I got you off track. Yeah. We'll edit this out later. It doesn't matter. Okay. Well, just on it's yeah the, the 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 pandemic and as you say the, the hoarding of toilet rolls and it's just a very small example but but it's another thing that 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 i've learned i suppose and, and again i've learned this through my career um about thinking and, and and emotional intelligence and i i've always called it the emotional mind and the intellectual mind um and it, it it's a it's something you learn in life, of course, but and, and relationships are a good way to learn it. And, and um, but but I've I've learned that emotions arrive whether you want them to or not. And you know the instinctive thing to do is to simply react to them. Yet the emotion, the emotion feels very real when it arrives. And you know from an evolutionary point of view, it's there for a reason. If a, you know if the if the and wild animals coming at you from the left field and you hadn't seen it, you, you need that emotional instinctive response to kind of get out of the way quick without having to go through the, the system of working out whether it's rationally correct to do so. You just need to react. And so I, I get why, to a large extent, why emotions are there. And so they're really important. But we've reached the apex. We're at the, you know, we're the top of the food chain. We don't need to worry too much about, you know, threats other than ourselves. So I think our development as a species is, is, to, is to learn to use this intellectual side of our brain, the rational side. So embrace the emotions when they arrive, understand why they've arrived, and then but be in control of them to a certain extent. Don't, don't, you don't have to be, they don't have to be in control of you. That's how I've always perceived 
emotional and intellectual. And then as I've talked to more people like yourself and John Cook, who does um, skeptical science, who is a psychologist by training. I interviewed he's him talked last about, week. Okay, cool. Yeah. So he talked about system two thinking and, and this fa thinking fast and slow is a book. I can't remember who wrote it, but it's up there behind me. Um, that's quite a meaty book. Actually, I haven't finished that one yet, but it's all the same sort of principle. It's, it's, the, uh, it's the rational thought against the emotive ir irrational thinking and from a climate change point of view the challenge i think of climate change communication is really that we're talking to perfectly decent normal hard-working people who who just want to get to work each day make enough money to look after their families and i always talk about this bell curve and in the middle although john tells me it's skewed towards concern and alarm which is good but generally speaking these people are just they react to the day-to-day -day, and we all do it and the problem with climate communication is, although it's getting more and more obvious by as every day goes by in the last three or four years, it's become, you know, the extreme weather events have become clearer. The fact is the long-term consequences of climate change <clears throat> are not um, emotionally obvious to the average human being. They need to be rationally considered and rationally accepted by the average human being. And that's a really difficult thing to do, to tell someone that, you know, driving a car today means that we could have three, three or four degrees of warming, maybe even after you've died, but perhaps when you're a very old person, um, at, but you still need to stop driving a car today because there'll be people alive then that need you to do what you're, you know, need you to change your ways today. Most people are like, yeah, I get that, but uh, it's just not, I, I, it's not tangible enough. And I, th therefore I don't care enough you know, them, they'll, they'll work it out. You know, you can, you can always go down any, there's any number of reasons why not to do something. And, and it's very easy to do, but, but finding the, the motivation to do something that is inconvenient to you now, because you know, it's the right thing to do for someone's existential, you know, safety in the future is, is an incredibly difficult um, communication message to get across. And I, and I think that's where the critical thinking and the, these two systems of thinking, teaching people how to do them in the first place is a good life skill. So if it got, regardless of climate change, helping people to understand how to stay in control of their emotional mind, not, not, not dismiss it, but stay in control of it, allow it to happen but understand it and be in control of it and then let your rational thinking and your actions be guided by your intellect and your rational mind. And that's kind of the, that's a been a big journey for me throughout my career really. But obviously it's really come to a fore in the last few years while I've been really thinking about it myself. Um, and it's, it's a fascinating field of, of research that I, I know a lot of people, psychologists in particular um, delve into and, uh, and that is a challenge that if we can get that across to more people, and I think it'll help us with the communication process. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I'm going to put you on the spot uh, to, to go even deeper in what you said. Were there any tips or tricks or things that made it easier for you? Anything that helped you change habits or, or grasp that emotional, say, realize it, uh, give it uh, its merit and then say, okay, but now I've got to, I've got to do it a different way because I've just read this report. I've just seen this. And, and is there any helps or things that for you that made it easier because you did apply some of those things. I mean, you said you're smoker, drinker, you know, yeah. you did all these things. So what, what was, well, that, was it easy? Those are the things in fact. And, and so one of the, one of the things that I've learned is to confront an issue but I've learned that through not confronting issues at every twist and turn through my earlier life and realizing eventually that this just doesn't, it just doesn't work. If you, so um, I can give you any number of examples, but relationships, certainly you know, the learning to live with loss is part of, is part of learning to make a change. And, and the intellectual mind is, well, I've found it to be extremely powerful in that process. So splitting up with a girlfriend, you know, and I've had several um, really people who I've really regarded as being, you know, this is this is definitely this time. This is definitely the one. We've all had those moments, um, and and you know, coming to the end of those relationships, um, I've again in my younger days, I'd try it both ways. We'd all, I'm sure, we've all done this. We've tried to sort of let's stay friends or drag on a little bit and maybe you know, keep opening the 
you know, a wound every now and again. And, and that's the emotional response because it's emotional. You don't want to let them go. Um, and it's the same with, frankly, it's the same with cigarettes and it's the same with alcohol because they're drugs that, that, and, and to a certain extent, relationships are crutches that you rely on in a good relationship. Of course, that's a symbiotic crutch. You're relying on each other. So you're, you're, the combination of the two people is a, is a stronger than the, the sum of the parts. And that's a good, healthy relationship. So there's nothing wrong with that. But in terms of other things, drugs and, and things that you take to try and replace that sense of, of belonging, they are only going in one direction and that's a destructive direction. And you can, and you can apply and people do generally apply the same emotional response to trying to quit. And the same with food, actually diets, people who go on diets all the time, trying to quit by thinking I'll just quit for a certain length of time isn't quitting you're just you're just holding your breath and you have to look oh, I've had to learn in my life that leaving a relationship is 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 like a loss um, and you have to grieve and you have to go through all those stages but you have to you have to stop and move on you have to change your mind and that's where the intellectual strength of mind gets starts to become in charge of the emotional mind you have to change you have to say that will that is gone it's put it away it's finished same with so with cigarettes i'll give you a little this is really stupid but with cigarettes this is when i was 30 i played a game with with nicotine so i was smoking 20 cigarettes a day and in my mind to help my intellectual mind make it into a in, really to get me through the first month actually because that's what everyone said was the hardest i kept score so every time i had a pang for a cigarette and i didn't have a cigarette one nil to me and pretty quickly it was two nil to me, three nil. To, in the first day it was 20 zero to me. And I was winning. I was winning. The, I'd, I'd made, I'd completely turned the cigarette about face from being my ally to being my enemy or my adversary. And now I was, now it was a game against me against that. And that's just a little, I'm not suggesting everyone uses that technique, but it was a, it was a technique that I helped, that helped me to get through the first month. And then after the first month, it was simply changing the mindset to say that now is finished. It's gone. And it was the same with alcohol. So, I mean, I wasn't an alcoholic, but I did reach the age of 35. And in the UK, the government have a recommended um, consumption, a weekly consumption, which was 21 units in those days. It's less now, but in those days it was 21 units, which is 10 pints of English beer a, a week kind of thing. And I realized at 35 that I am based on that number of weekly intake, I had already drunk my lifetime's worth of alcohol because I was drinking a hundred units a week, something like that. Um, so I, so it was beginning to, I never drank through the day. I never, I wasn't one of these people who got up and drank in the morning. I just like to have a drink in the evenings, but I start, I realized it was beginning to dictate the structure of a day. You know, my working day was kind of, well, I'm just getting through till half past five when I can get home and, you know, crack open a beer. Living for not the good. drink, living for the smoke, yeah, living for the not weekend good. type of a yeah. thing. Yeah. So you have to, so you have to, again, you have, you can't, you can't say I'll cut, or for me anyway, cutting down wasn't an option. It's not, it's not, that's not changing your mindset. Um, and so uh, I learned to confront the issue that way, to change. You just have to accept that it's gone, put it away. It's yeah, finished. form a gamification almost, you know, the way you Kinda, kind yeah. of skip, yeah. kept score. I truly and believe there's multiple, you know, not just the one you said. I think that it, we're all individual and there's multiple different things that work for different people, male, female, yeah. child, youth, uh, you know, uh, different age groups of cultures and things that, that, that are the, the way. But there are so many tools available out there to grasp at. And when, when – you're done saying that your your comment that you want to make. I, I want to kind of maybe run through an exercise with you, a, a tool that we can give our listeners of uh, to kind of shift from a habit or shift their mindset on on the way you do something. Mm -hmm. yeah. You wanted to say just something. Gonna, well, the, it was just going <clears> to <throat> to finish on the the benefit of doing that way because that or what I've just described sounds oh Christ, you know, what a nightmare. Actually. The, I cannot begin to describe adequately the huge benefit of, of applying that discipline to your life because once you've, once you've 
done it and and the the crutch you've realized you don't need the crutch and you've reconstructed the way you act and and operate on a daily basis without that crutch the benefit the the liberation if you like is amazing it i mean i'm not just saying that it is it is surprising how how much better things are when you you know when you realize that these things aren't helping you they're just hindering you that's that's the benefit but again you need the critical you need the ability to see past the 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 the, the here and now to understand that that's what's going to happen and that's the difficult part but i having gone through it in my life and realized and come through the other side with those examples that i've just talked about i realize that that that's what's that's the goal that's the that's the uh, the prize that's available to you that's the last point i was going to make with um addictive substances or habits that are really bad for health this is probably not the best best method or example of of how to do it but just another simple simple kind of um not only an analogy but example of how we can change our habits uh, i want to run our listeners through it so those who are listening on podcasts kind of follow along i want you to fold your arm Fold your arms together, and then I want you to look down at your wrists. And uh, for me, my right wrist is up. I don't know which, which wrist is up for you, Dave. I've got my left wrist. Your left, left wrist. wrist. Okay, now that's because it's comfortable. That's how we've always done it. It's the way we've you know, been learned. It's just comfortable. We don't even have to think about it. Now, I want to drop your arms for a minute, and I want you to recross and fold your arms. And again, for me... It's always wow. pretty much the right. I don't, you know, do it different. But if now, well, did you do it different? I tried to deliberately and it feels extremely uncomfortable. Exactly. So what happens if now we were to do it a third time, but to do it the different way, it goes slower. It is possible. But just like I saw in the video with you, you had to think about it. You kind of, you know, you're like, okay, well, how do I put yes. the other one up? So one, you have to think about it. You have to um, physically think, and how do you do it? You could tell that it wasn't comfortable. It wasn't what your habit was, um, but it is possible. If you practice it probably you know, 30, 40, 50 times, then it might become a habit or yeah. very natural once we do it. And um, it's just something that we kind of have uh, to consciously think about with a lot of habits, with a lot of changes, um, not so much with the addictive ones. If we have a bad day and we don't want to get up and do our diet or do go to the gym, um, then we we have you know one day where we sleep in. But if the majority of your days are the ones going to the gym and doing the workout, or the majority of the ones are changing your habits, moving in the right direction over time that building a habit and building that change and it really helps to to turn on that light because you see the benefits of health and weight and surrounding mm. in your environment you see that it's actually a better system it works better for you and uh, you know there's so many tools and uh, to use to apply to to change that that are mixed with the mind and body, not just the emotional and the mindset, but it's also physically getting into a habit of, of doing something. And it's just a, it's really a freeing thing. And I, I appreciate you going down that rabbit hole and, and, and sharing that with me. Your last video that you released uh, yesterday was a, a mixture between the sustainable development goals um, the SOFI report, which is the state of food uh, uh, insecurity, security, nutrition, that was just released. Um, and you had to re read a couple, I believe it was the IRENA report and a few other reports on, on that. It mm -hmm. was a fabulous video. But I, you know I'm an advocate for the sustainable development goals. I want to know your view after reading that report and doing that podcast, do you believe that the sustainable development goals are a roadmap, a plan for 2030 to get us there? Are they achievable? 
in, in your mind. Can you tell us a little bit your thoughts and feelings on that, what you learned? My, yeah, I can. I mean, I, I think they, so I think they are a roadmap. I think the, I think some of them are more achievable than others, of course. Um, they are interlinked. There's no question about that. The 2030 target, um, do I, I hope we get there, but I'm not sure we will. That's the honest answer. And the reason is, in my mind, well, there's a few, I suppose, but, but the first, let's go back to 2015, the Paris Accord. Yes. My, my concern with the Paris Accord uh, or the agreement was that some, some national governments may have seen that as, a, as an end point rather than a starting point. And there was a collective sigh of relief that we'd reached that agreement and was a big cheer in the room and all of the rest of it, which was great. And it was, a, there's no question it was a great achievement, but I, I, you know, whichever way you look at it, you, we haven't seen the progress in the, in the ensuing five years that we need and national determined contributions are a perfect example. Um, they're nowhere near where they need to be. Even the ones that they eventually put in take us to three degrees of warming by 2100, not 1.5. So, I suppose if the it depends what the specifically what what we hope will achieve will we achieve keeping our global average atmospheric temperature below 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels no in my opinion I think that's already baked into the atmosphere I think there's enough co2 up there already that we're probably going to get there anyway with the delayed effect of of the of the reaction is there but does that make them useless no of course not so there's two ends you know it, there's two ends of the spectrum and they're, they're, they are definitely a focal point. I don't think there's been enough, uh, except that's point one. Point two, the you know, fossil fuel and, and um, agribusiness and big pharma have done everything, everything in their power to stop those things happening, to protect their financial interest. Everything, I mean, incredible. So that's not going to stop, at least not in the near term. But it's been a massive break on progress, in my opinion. Um, so that's political inertia, commercial inertia, if you like, and, and all the corporate lobbyists have helped with that. Um, and then communication. So a perfect example, I, I started a, um, I did a presentation at my work to try and start us on a, um, a carbon footprint audit of our business, if you like. And I presented and I, I used the, the, the um, sustainable development goals as a, as a starting point, a bit like I did in yesterday's video, because that's where I think it should be. It's, this is let's mm -hmm. start everything, frame it with this because it's that it's all there. Yeah. And none of them had none of them had heard of the sustainable development. No one, not a person in the room, educated, you know, well paid middle managers and senior managers in a, in a London, you know, young, quite young, switched on people. None of them had heard of it. So that's, and that's not the UN's fault and it's not the fault of the sustainable development goals. Somewhere in the middle, it's got the messages, certainly in, in this country anyway, I can't speak for everywhere in Europe, but, or America, but in this country, that message hasn't got to the public. So I- I'm so, gonna have to disagree with you. Okay. So I think it is the UN's problem for presenting okay. it to us um, in the wrong way. I don't think uh, many people have no clue how to look at the sustainable development goals. They don't know if they're for countries, corporations, if they're for cities, who they're for. And they're actually the biggest project everyone. They're for every, the open source, transparent, and they're for each individual. And they have to do with us. It's our future, you know? Yeah. And, and when we were presented with them, um, we, we didn't understand a few things, and if you don't mind me just interjecting and kind of uh, uh, of sure. giving so, because I, I want to I want to maybe go deeper into why that is, and and ask you some secondary questions in regards to that. First off, it was a, a historical global precedence before the Paris Agreement, uh, the twenty thirty agenda, September twenty fourth in two thousand and fifteen the sustainable development goals were launched and um, 193 plus countries agreed on them as goals and a roadmap to, to keep us, at that time it was two degrees of warming. So that we yeah. still had that, that, 
the two degrees. And then at the Paris Agreement in December, uh, um, uh, COP21, they kind of set a little bit more ambition and dropped it to 1.5. And we had to make some adjustments in the goals, but also in the plan and the roadmap which was fine because we'd already run out the scenarios and, and looked at uh, that well before we even started. Because the way the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement to, were done was with a backcast from December 2030 to 2015, saying, okay, this is what our temperature would be. And it was started at two yeah. degrees right here. And this is the steps, the roadmap, the plan, the goals that we need with targets and indicators to be able to reach this. This is what we need to do. And so there was back casting involved, systems dynamic modeling and mapping. There was um, foresight, a little bit of foresight modeling involved in that. And then the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, the um, the UN, the World Economic Forum, and many, and many others came by and said, how much monies are needed to achieve them by 2030? And, and at the time, it was 90 trillion US dollars to do that. So 6 trillion US dollars a year. And now it's about 95 trillion in order to reach and maybe even mm. a little bit 96 trillion because we're behind. And then there was many, many other factors involved in that whole thing. But when we were presented with them, where it's like um, a kid's carnival almost, you know, here's these colorful 17 goals. And uh, when I tell people I'm an advocate, a lot of the time they say, oh, I like number one, no poverty. Yeah. Uh, it's red. It's my favorite color. That's the one I'm working on. And it's virtually impossible, as you said, to work just on one sustainable development goal and not touch on all the others. If you were to try to just work on no poverty, you would touch on zero hunger, quality education, well-being, uh, industry infrastructure, um, in innovation. You would touch on life on land, life below water, clean water and sanitation, climate change, and many, many others. So there's 11 um, sustainable development goals that are intrinsically tied just to food, and all 17 of them are tied to food as well and many, many other industries there because they're a system. And so I, I, I feel that one, we were presented them wrong, but more importantly than that, we didn't understand what a historical precedence that was and that it's actually a roadmap and plan for a better future. That once we reach them, what does it look and feel like once we've reached them and that it creates a secure, infrastructure. We'll still have climate change and some issues because the pollutions we put in today are usually not seen for another 10 years and, you know, going back in history as well, the same thing. And, and we're obviously a little bit off of target. But had we begun right at 2015, had we have known how to understand them and apply them and what that means for us, more of a vision of what that looks like to be standing December 2030 there, what it feels like, what the world looks like, how to envision it, so that we have even something to work and uh, strive for, mm. so that we can engineer, create, innovate, and, and, and design for that outcome. I, I think we, we drastically failed. And, and the next thing before I touch on the, on, on the, que the follow-up questions to that is, I don't think before was the Millennium Development Goals, but there is no other plan globally for the entire world out there. No. So even if we said, forget about the SDGs, what, is it the new, the new Green Deal? What's, what's the other plan that we have? <laughs> And I think one of the problem, well, the problem we have, of course, is that is that nationalism is taking the place of globalism to a certain extent. And then once that's happened, and again, you've got a pendulum swing. I guess it's this is not new in history. We've, you know, I talk, my brother-in-law's father's ninety-four years old, and you know, I talked to him about these things. He's like, yeah, I remember this and that and the war, and you know, he's kind of seen these these political pendulum swing throughout his lifetime. Um, but there's no question that in the last five years the pendulum has swung very far in a way that we all know. We all see it on the television. You don't need me to describe it, but it, it's, it makes nations retrench into their silos and become 
um, very defensive and, you know, keep them, it's a, it gets to them and us, keep them out. So that's one thing. And you've got, and you've also got other political agendas. And the main one, of course, is China's ascendancy in towards the being the dominant economy in the world. And the United States are very unhappy about that, understandably. The, the UK went through it with the empire, you know, does decades ago. And it's a painful process. And the incumbent does obviously not want to become second best to anybody because they've been used to being at the top of the tree. That is happening. And Mr. Trump is exacerbating that in a way that no one could possibly even have imagined. Um, and let's hope in November that that situation changes without wishing to be too political. But I think for the good of mankind, it's important that he's not the leader of that country for the I next agree. four years, because he's done enough damage in the last four. That, that dynamic is happening. And then you've got the European Union, you've got the UK coming out in Brexit. These are all big, important, um, you know, super blocks of power that, that govern more or less how everything works in the world. Um, and it's interesting when you talk about or we'll hear from people that write the IPCC um, reports, who were these, you know, the seminal report, as you know, the SR15 in 2018, which is the one that really hopefully woke us, certainly woke me up. Another seminal moment in my time on the video uh, making process was to cover that in quite some detail in four very detailed programs. But the comment that you got from the, from the authors of the reports was that we, you know, we bring all the information in. Um, and then we spend months dotting I's and taking one word out of a sentence because it's not allowed by the, all the international lawyers and has to be ag agreed by every single political nation involved in the process and their lawyers. So it's got to be legally binding. All of these things it makes it almost impossible to really give a strong message. And what they, I mean, even though it's a very terrifying document, it's still probably been reduced down to the lowest common denominator that's acceptable to all. Um, and I think in a similar way, the SDGs uh, have suffered from that barrier uh, um, uh, in terms of getting a global consensus. What we need is global consensus. What we need to understand is that this is one uh, life support system in the vast emptiness of space, never mind Mars or the moon, that's a nonsense. We might get there, but it probably will be a, an affectation rather than something useful. We are living on this planet. We've always lived on this planet. We are supremely adapted and evolved to live only on this planet. And we need to make sure we look after this planet. And that means one, one goal, one ambition, one drive, coordinated action by every country on, the, on earth, not retrenching into our silos and becoming nationalistic. And well, as long yeah. as we sort our country out, you know, don't let anybody in, and then we can have our little ecosystem in our country. It's so short-sighted. And the people that think that that might work and billionaires going into their bunkers or whatever it might be, they think they can insulate themselves from nature. They are insane, insanely deluded. Yeah. Um, so again, as I said earlier, we can, either, we can either buckle up and understand and confront the issue globally as a, as a global collective, or nature will just do it for us. It's happening, whatever, however much, whatever, doesn't matter what anybody says, nature will sort it out. We can work alongside nature and get it right, or we can try and battle nature and probably be our demise eventually if we really, if we really pig head enough to let, let it happen. So that's the, I think, and that's the problem I think with the SDGs that, that they need to be. Uh, and again, um, just to finish talking about the, the, the thing that gives me hope, uh, one of the things is this pendulum mechanism that's that's already moving in the other direction in my opinion and so i think we will see in the next four years i'm very hopeful about this we will see a movement back towards that global consensus um and so that's why i'm still hopeful and i think there's still a chance we've still got nine years left it needs to be a busy nine years though there, there's a lot of chance and hope um out there I wrote the Sustainable Development Goal Manifesto uh, for the United Nations. And um, the reason I wrote it was to give people a vision, an idea of what that world looks like so they could envision themselves standing in this world in December 2030. Because we're, uh, we're kind of both these trekky or kind of nerdy techno lust uh, type of guys. We <laughs> like the technology yeah. and the editing tools and things. But if we don't have a media or a vision, 
what to envision the future, then we can't create, design, or engineer. We can't reach it. And uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to, to read it to you and then give you um, the, the one disagreement that I have, and it's not that major of a disagreement um, with, the, with the SDGs, but I, I, I touch upon it in the manifesto and I'll explain it, but I'd like you to maybe close your eyes or envision what it would feel or look like to when I'm reading this manifesto, it, when we reach it in December, 2030. Imagine a world where there is no poverty and zero hunger. We have good health and well-being, quality education, and full gender equality everywhere. There is clean water and sanitation for everyone. Affordable and clean energy has created decent work and sustainable economic growth. Our prosperity is fueled by investments in resilient industry, innovation, and infrastructure, and that has reduced inequalities. We live in sustainable cities and communities and responsible consumption and production has healed our planet. Climate action has stopped and reversed the warming of our planet and we have flourishing life below water and abundant diverse life on land. We enjoy peace and justice through strong institutions and have built long-term partnerships for the goals. Now, that's a, a future that I'd love to to live in. That's kind of this global citizen, this globalized world in some respects where we, everyone everywhere has all these basic universal inalienable rights uh, and it creates a nice infrastructure to springboard off into. Now the two areas that I disagree with, um, and it's really only one, but it's two. One is instead of just decent work and economic growth, I, I, I entered the word sustainable growth, economic mm. growth, because mm. I think capitalism and economic growth, they're just like the book, 1972, The Limits to Growth. There is a limit to growth. And if we have sustainable economic growth, one that's good for all humanity on this planet, that's good. And then the second one that I added was resilient industry, innovation, and infrastructure. There is industry innovation and infrastructure that's not at all sustainable or resilient and uh, it's just out there to to take the resources as quick and fast as possible and yeah and it's this cradle to grave mentality and if we change those two things and and, and build that vision and boy what a what a beautiful future that truly can be and um I wanted people to have that vision. The added caveat to, to knowing how they work in a si system, to understand the monies, the, the roadmap that's been there, the historical precedents, is also as humans, we're unaware that of the exponential function. We under, don't understand exponential at all so how quickly that goes how it works how it's working yeah. in our lives and things in the the good bad and ugly in our world already is growing exponentially climate change and pollution and many other things there's a flip side to that exponential function and it can be used for technology and computing but it also can be used at solving the problem we're in in, in this pandemic World Economic Forum is calling it the Great Reset, but this pause has helped us in some respect, but more so to see that the entire world can pivot on a dime, on a penny, mm -hmm. and, and start going in a different direction, even if it's kind of a lockdown, not willed, or, or you know, not everybody's totally on board with, you know, there's all sorts of debate and different things there but and we've seen it before with industry in america where uh, during the wars that they pivoted entire industries to making war machines from other things or to you know you know yeah from producing cars to producing other things so um we we have unimaginable abilities to 
to use that function, to use it for good, to make some change. And the beginning of this year was really, for me, started out where we'd placed both our feet on this exponential roadmap. Then COVID happened and um, everybody's just thrown off, off kilter and doesn't sure. know what's going on and, and is, uh, is looking for solution, understandably so. It's uh, deep respect and, and um, humility needs to be taken with, with what's happened. But in that, we saw some positive things come out of it. One, Earth Overshoot Day last year was July 29th the day we went beyond our finite resources. This year, mm -hmm. three or four weeks ago now, they released the new date for Earth Overshoot Day, August um, 22nd. We've gained 24 more days uh -huh. in that pause. The other thing is quarter one of, of stocks and interest and investment, we have seen that those companies that have invested in sustainability and sustainable development, what they're calling ESG investments, environmental, social governance, investment mm -hmm. portfolios and divestments, um, that those companies have all weathered the storm very well, uh, weathered it better than their conventional counterparts. And so there's that capitalism, that other type of factor in there that's all as well, it's expensive, it's not doable, it, what's the result? And the results are there. We, we've been able yeah. to see them in many respects. And so uh, there's always going to be that balance, that yin and the yang and, and, um, in our world where I don't think it'll ever be perfect. It won't, and, and nor should it be in some sense, because the human, the human spirit needs to, needs to flourish. We don't, again, I've said this before, we don't just want to survive the 21st century. We want to survive and flourish as a species, and we want to make sure that as far as we possibly can, we allow all the other species to survive and flourish as well. Um, and species come and go all the time, of course. I, you know, we, we need to be not, not, not too rose-tinted rose spectacles. We need to understand we live in a real world and it's tough and, and all the rest of it. But we have, we have characters and personalities and those need to be allowed to, to, you know, to come to the fore within, within the, the context of, of sustainability and, and sustainable living. One of the things I think, to, to your point, that also the pandemic has showed us is similar to the, the wartime effort, that how on a dime, again, a government can, at least I can take the example of the UK government, can find a way to put, in our, in our case, a furlough system in, for example, that's paying the wages of, you know, uh, uh, millions and millions of, of, I think it's 9 million or something or more um, workers in the UK, you know, were furloughed and paid by the government to 80% anyway. Now that's money that they, 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 you know, they plucked from thin air, but we can do that because in ironically, because of the crazy nature of our currency systems around the world, governments are able to generate ways of, of paying for things that, that, that they by frankly by manipulating their currencies because they can so we've put some you know we've we've done bond bond sales and, and quantitative easing and and borrowing money on 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 markets um as a as a country because we can afford to do that and we've got a good credit rating it's all money that we owe someone somewhere in the dis deep and distant future that'll probably never get repaid but the point is governments can make that pivot if they need to if if the if the consensus is there and they realize that the the immediacy of the problem and, and that's where i think the opportunity is for climate change when governments realize that that's the same problem we've got with climate change and that we need to put these pivots in place um marshall plans for the world if you like uh and and communicate that properly to them to the masses and support them so we need public private partnerships to get us to that 2030 or even if it's 2040 but whatever to get us moving forwards we need the government to impose support well to put in support mechanisms financially but also to impose the sanctions on on players that don't want to cooperate and don't want to commercial players that think they can see some sort of advantage in in a you know in a in a in a system where they can they can not play by the same rules as everyone else and then score a bit of an advantage as a result we need to make sure they are sanctioned so that the incentive isn't there for them to do that um, and the government, we need governments to do that. And, I, and I'm not saying we need to go to, you know, 
everyone immediately goes, oh, you're a socialist, communist, pinko, whatever. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying, I'm not saying government should dictate. Uh, you know, I read Animal Farm and I know how bad it can get when, you know, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Uh, that's not a world I want to live in either. No. And there are examples. There are examples of how that works elsewhere in the world, and I don't like the look of them. So, but we, but we need the government to be there as a strong and stable central resource that can, uh, can at the same time apply um, resource financially and support mechanisms for those less fortunate, and apply sanctions to big corporate powerful players who don't play by the rules. And right now, I don't think we've got that. But certainly in in arguably in the states and, and other areas where you know none of us are none of us are paragons of virtue that balance is wrong i think um, and i'm not absolutely sure how we fix it other than by changing the, the administrations in those countries i'd, I'd like to uh, try to convince you maybe to do some more videos about the sustainable development goals to raise some uh, awareness to help people figure out how to apply them in their lives and to to view them no pressure but uh, i would love to to see that happen because i believe there's so much around them that if people realize that they are uh, a new operating system a new roadmap it's not a couple of tweaks on business as usual so we're not just infusing sustainability in business as usual or doing greenwashing which is also mm -hmm. a video that you've mm -hmm. done um, if you truly get into the meat and potatoes of the SDGs, you'll, you'll realize it's a total new global environmental, social, and governance operating system model. There's yeah. no way that um, no matter what nation, uh, no matter what city uh, culture can keep their same operating models in this nationalistic, these closed environment they have to kind of step it up to a new global operating basis model they can still have nations and borders and division that's okay sure. but the yep. global operating system the model that keeps us sustainably within planetary boundaries it is one such that is well laid out in the sustainable development goals as this paris agreement uh, agenda 2030 to to get us there and i i'm fortunate enough to um be on, on a project called Resilience Frontiers. It's the roadmap. What happens after 2030, after we've reached the Sustainable Development Goals, a roadmap from 2030 to 2050, uh -huh. uh, could be the Resilience Development Goals, the Resilience Goals, because what we're seeing, we're seeing it now, is that even once we have businesses and a life of this great sustainability, we're already beyond the limits to growth and we don't know what kind of climate calamities, pandemics or things will come in the future. And we really need to build resilience into our infrastructures so that we can um, have food and energy and things for tomorrow because mm. uh, the, the best example, although it was already a bad system was in Puerto Rico, uh, Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico and um, in one day wiped out their entire infrastructure mm -hmm. and all the and more than 90 percent of their agriculture farming and food supply and that doesn't grow back the very next day when people need energy and resources and food and water absolutely and so if they had had resilience or even some form of sustainability which was a very political thing and and all sorts of other factors then they would be in a better situation now. And that's something that takes four to six years. I don't think they've even fully mm. recovered till today. Um, those are the type of things that we're looking for in the future. And it's, it's not the resilience where we're saying, okay, today we're wearing face masks. The resilience in the future means we're wearing oxygen masks or gas masks or spacesuits. No, it's the resilience that we've fixed living within planetary yeah. boundaries to be able to enjoy weather resources our nature and in harmony uh, with nature and and that's the secondary questions on the sustainable development goals to you what does it take uh, what would it in your mind what would it take or uh, for people more people to jump on board to apply that do you think it's just a curve like you've made in your progress to know more about it, to, to understand it more, or is there, um, how, 
how can we do that? Or do you think that there's going to be, you know, a, a re-scrapping or a restart of that somehow? Are there other ideas just on, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but so we can move forward with that. Well, as I say, I mean, I, my, my view is that, that if you've got this bell, whatever you do, you've got to take the masses with you. And there's 7.6 billion people on the planet today. And, there's, and we're now here. There's, we thought there were going to be 11 billion by 2100. But now the UN tell us it's 9 billion. So that's interesting. That's gone down by 2 billion. Nevertheless, there's growth still, even though the fertility rate's coming down. The point is, you have to find a way, I think, if we're going to move a global operating system to a new paradigm, then you've got to take everybody with you. And some of them will be more reluctant than others. And that's why you've got this curve. But so most people in here are, are will need to be will need to be taken they won't go there on their own um once they're there they'll just carry on with they'll just accept the new system and and get on with it because people do we're remarkably adaptable but asking them to go there voluntarily is problematic in, in my experience um so y you do need to explain the the what how and why and as best you can, you need to explain why we're going to the place we're going to. And those people, at least in a democratic society, get to choose who, the, who leads that, that, that direction. Um, but once a government is in place, there are certain things, I think, that governments need to do to, to make things happen. They just need to make things. So, for example, $480 billion of subsidy to the fossil fuel industry each year. We just need to take it away. I know you can't just take it away. We need to put in place mechanisms that say that is being removed over a period of time. Even if it's going to take 10 years to remove it, the markets will see that and react immediately. They're already doing that anyway, coming and taking their investment out of fossil fuel and putting it into sustainable projects. So you need to, the people need to be taken with you and, and co collective action and activism is helping to adjust public perception so that's that's this level if you like so public perception is definitely changing xr and people like greta thunberg um, and others in the us and what have you they're changing public perception that public is then putting pressure upwards to their elected representatives to change the way they interact those representatives are then realizing oh, okay so i don't need to be quite so scared of changing things these people are a bit more adaptable than i thought so therefore i can start standing up to the lobbyists and corporate um, powers a bit more than I have been because I'm, le I'm less scared of getting voted out by these people because they're telling me it's fine. Then you're starting to get some kind of loop there. And these corporate lobbyists who, who, who want to maintain the status quo, which is not sustainable, begin to get less and less power in that loop. And that's a virtuous circle. And it's starting to happen already today, um, at least in, you know, in Western democracies. Uh, even in the United States, it's happening. I mean, there's, there's still 20, I think it's 23 states that are still very much signed up to the, um, the Paris Agreement. Yeah. So states are, states are doing it. Most or nearly half the states are doing it and it's going up all the time. And I think probably at least half the population, certainly 59% of Americans are aware and or concerned or alarmed about climate change. Um, so they're in the majority already. So you've got, pub you've got a movement towards greater and greater public consensus all the time, which is giving more political strength to our leaders um, to oppose the lobbying and the money that's coming into politics. So that's the only way it's going to change, in my opinion, if that's not too garbled a message. but No, that's, that's a great message. So I also ask a question. Do you feel like you're a global citizen in any respects even though you're in the united kingdom and what if the future held a world where we had removal of walls and borders and nations how would you feel what what are your thoughts on that have you read anything or done anything in that respect in your your videos or your research well I, uh, this is a double-edged sword as well i think mark because You've got, I suppose you've got near term and long term consequences of what you're describing. Um, and some of those will be brought about by climate change as well. So um, from a global citizen point of view, my own personal view is if we had more global integration of uh, and interracial integration as well, and, and, and more people moving and starting to understand each other's cultures and maybe even in, interbreeding. 
um, and we start getting a, a global species, if you like, that's a little more homogenous. Um, I'm not averse to that at all because I think that will that will build in greater empathy around the world of each other's cultures. And again, you can still keep national identity, um, but the, so the near term worry that I have is that climate change is going to do that anyway because the damage we're causing in many parts of the world will mean people have to migrate away from areas that are simply in, a, in inhabitable they can't grow food anymore and they're going to have to move so that's going to be forced upon us so the urgency to to knock down these walls and to become more acceptant of others into your space is growing every day because the climate change is, is causing that to happen so in uh, and in the short term, this is why I say it's a double-edged sword. In the short term, my worry is that that's going to cause a lot of destruction of life as well as property. There's going to be conflict. Take Bangladesh as a good example. I think there's 160 million people in that country. The bottom of it's pretty much almost underwater and they get huge storm surges every year, as you well know, destroying vast tracts of agricultural land and people's livelihoods. And many of those people ideally would move northwards away from the lower lying ground. And they're not being allowed to do that by restrictive practices, particularly by India, yeah. literally put up a wall. There's a bigger wall between India and everywhere else in the south of in the south of America. So a lot of people are going to die. Those people can't get in anywhere else. They're just going to die, millions of them. And that's my great sadness about the near term. And I'm not sure there's. I'm not sure we're going to avoid that in the 21st century. Uh, millions and millions of people dying prematurely. And I have to accept that. And and perhaps look to the longer term when this integration that you talk about and this greater globalization, the project of uh, this, this global reset of a, a new operating system. I, I, my personal view is it's a bit sad, but I, I can't see that happening by 2030. I can see it happening. And I don't think we're going to go extinct in the meantime. I just think it's almost inevitable that we're going to do ourselves quite a lot of damage and in so, in so doing, we probably will realize that we need to um, embrace this new system, whether we like it or not. And then once we've embraced it, life will go on and the world will be certainly a better place. I won't be around to see that. I don't think, but I'm still hopeful that, that, and I still, I'm very aware that what I do today affects the outcome of that journey. And the more I do today and the more you do and the more everyone else does, the better chance we have of proving me wrong and achieving that result maybe in my lifetime or even, you know, who knows by 2030 or 2040, that would be amazing. But that will take, I think that will take a change of, of, of public collective action and, and philosophy, probably the like of which we haven't ever seen in our, in our history. So that doesn't mean it's impossible, but I think it's very, very tough ask. So I've led you uh, on a path to two of my most um, difficult questions to answer for a lot of people. And um, I want to caveat it a little bit because you've done, in, in some respects, you're, you're telling me you're not 100% optimistic. You're, you're not sure we're going to make it or think that there's definitely going to be some human suffering and things or that you might not live through it. But you've also reported on, for example, the batteries in aviation or different type of hydrogen fuel, jet fuels for aviation. And in that report, which is a small glimpse into the future of air travel, uh, we're seeing numbers of 2022 to 2024, 2026 at the latest for an actual total different vision of, of just that one sector which also has a huge social and environmental and also um, impacts on nations and borders on how we travel and get around and and how that looks for the future so that's a, a kind of a vision in the future and you've you've researched it i don't know how you've seen the numbers lately but there are hundreds of thousands of companies working on this moving towards that ilium is prepared to do a five a, autonomous five passenger taxi by 2024 the yeah. latest and many many others that you that you did so that's a glimpse of the future 
Um, and it's fairly quick. If yeah. you were to ask us even 10 years ago, we'd say, no way in hell. That's the cra that's science, sure. science fiction, right? Uh, the same yeah. way m most people speak about the internet or autonomous driving vehicles would say it never will happen. It's science fiction because we misjudge the future and that exponential function, how quickly we can achieve that. The, the, the second one that's important about, uh, about that vision of the future is also you do a lot about renewables, batteries, mm -hmm. and, and those tr trends, which are growing exponentially. Yeah, that, sure. That's sustainable innovation. Yeah. So with all that in mind, I, I'm going to ask you the burning question, WTF, and it's not the swear word. It's what's the future, and I, I don't I don't want to know what it is for everybody else. I want to know what it is for just have a think for you, Dave. That's what I'd like to know. So you're right. All those things are absolutely true, and I, and I will continue to. The future for me is to continue to champion those people who are working on these innovative um, uh, technologies that will that will. This is we're really talking about the energy system here rather than the food system, um, and the two things are so closely interlinked, but. From a purely energy system point of view, the future for me is um, is distributed smart grids across nations and even across continents, um, and that's happening in Europe at the moment. That's being implemented as we speak. People are getting smart meters, and if you if you can if you know your viewers and listeners and we can envisage a world where, let's take the UK for example, there's 27 million homes in the UK. Um, if each one of those homes had a vehicle, electric vehicle that had vehicle to grid capability. So that's a, basically a battery with four, a wheel at each corner, charge it up at night, it's ready, it's full in the morning, you go to work, you do whatever you need to do on electric. That electricity comes from a grid that's supplied by renewable energy, wind and solar, and maybe hydro, and maybe a little bit of nuclear in the short term. That's another, we won't go down mm -hmm. that perhaps, but, um, and, but there's 27 million of them. And in the home, you've got an electric boiler that also has a battery that has that battery to grid technology. That's, those are being built today as well. Um, and homes can be converted very, very quickly, as you say, across to these technologies. All of a sudden, the problem that most fossil fuel and, and, and deniers tell you is this problem of, of, of spikes and, and base load energy for, for grids. All of a sudden, that, that problem is almost in almost eliminated not quite but almost eliminated because the spikes don't exist and there's so much micro input coming from so many millions of different sources the only challenge is managing it in in the central hub of the grid which is just an algorithm and they've got those as well because the computers can cope with that kind of data input nowadays in the way they couldn't 10 years ago as you say the technology is there to do that um and then suddenly you've got a whole energy provision system that, that isn't reliant on fossil fuels in, in any way so that's a massive step and energy storage is the answer to that as you said um and it's not just lithium-ion battery storage there's all there's any number of energy storage systems that are being devised around the world now that are incredibly innovative use lateral thinking very logical just looking at the, the problem outside the box and thinking what we need to do is to create some kind of stored thing here that we can let go again at a later time to cause you know movement across a generator effectively to cause electrical electrons to, to flow that's really in essence that's what electricity is it doesn't have to be an electrolytic process across you know across a battery it could be moving a stone to the top of a hill and you know letting it roll down the hill and tying a string to it and the string drives a generator and that's what pumped hydro is kind of thinking but there's buildings that that raise on cranes, big, huge weights up the top of the building and use gravity, you know, gravity systems to allow that potential energy to be um, enhanced. Liquid air batteries that I looked at a few weeks ago by freezing the air using renewable energy, storing that frozen air, cryogenically frozen down to incredibly low temperatures. And then you can allow it whenever you need it, you can allow it to go back out and warmed up by the atmosphere back up to normal temperature that makes it change state from liquid to gas the gas flows across the generator hey presto you've got electricity these are just things we didn't think we needed to do it wasn't that we didn't know how to do them we just didn't think we needed to 20 years ago because we just had we just burned some more oil and coal and stick that across the generator and boil water with that the impetus wasn't there to do these things and now it is these ideas are coming out of the woodwork 
as you say, really, it is really exponential. And the change in, in how that system is being implemented is exponential. And again, communicating that to the general public and making them realise that this change is happening beneath their feet without them having to go to sackcloth and ashes and become Neanderthal man again, almost without any perceptible change in their existence. And all we're asking you to do is maybe cut down on the amount of food you eat from Portugal or Spain and, you know, try and buy local and accept seasonality of food. Maybe you can't have strawberries in the winter because that's not where they grow in your country. But is that really a big deal? Pick something else to eat in the winter and start doing what, the way my grandparents lived before the war, great grandparents, they ate seasonal food because that's what was available to them at the time. They couldn't fly something in from China or the Maldives or somewhere. They just had to accept what they, what they had and they ate perfectly well, not a problem. So the, there is hope. I, I am pragmatic really, Mark. I'm not pessimistic and I'm not a sort of blindedly optimistic. I am pragmatic. These things won't happen by magic. They've got to be done by, and from an energy point of view, it's pragmatic, hard-nosed engineers you know, girls and boys engineers who are doing these things today all over the world as we sleep almost and, and these systems are being put in place. So that, that does give me huge hope. But, but most of that activity is taking place, to be fair, in the Western industrialised world. And I, I really would love to see more of it taking place in the developing nations so that we can leapfrog this, this reliance on fossil fuels to get them up, which is what they're doing really, to get them up to the level of a development that, that's somewhere equitable to us um they are to accelerate that process there's a there's a temptation to use fossil fuels and china are not helping in that but china are shipping a lot of their coal across to asia and africa as well to fund projects that are that are not you know not being made in a sustainable way so again i see great progress in the in the, in the western industrialized nations and through no fault of their own we're not sharing that progress with our with our friends and cousins in the developing nations. Can I, can I put you on the spot and say, can you give us a paragraph? What's the future? <laughs> that was the you, question I you mean, asked me, wasn't I, it? I, I, I digressed. <laughs> what's, no, you didn't digress. You answered it in, in many respects and I kind of set it up a little bit because of that. But is there any way uh, for, for you? It's not for, it's for you, Dave. You need to answer the question, what's the future, Dave? And um, uh, if you could do it in a paragraph, I'd, I'd love that. Since you, you're, you're so good at this with your videos, uh, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but I... The future for me is, is uh, freedom, freedom to behave the way I want to behave with the knowledge and the wisdom to use the resources available to me in a wise and sustainable way understanding that everybody around me is doing the same thing so we're all in it together i'm a liverpool football fan soccer fan bill shankley was the manager when i was a boy and he said the socialism i believe in is everyone working for each other and everybody having a share of the rewards it's the way i see football and it's the way i see life thank you wow that's that's absolutely beautiful now th this uh is probably my last hard question for you and it's very similar to the burning question with a, a little bit of a twist because I want to I, I want to put you in the spot of someone who's uh, thinking differently uh, critical thinking what does a world that works for everyone look like for you you might have already answered it, but I think works for everyone. A lot of women don't like football, so that's why I think it's a yeah, little bit fair, different answer, right? Fair point. I think a work. I think a, for me personally. So let's see. What am I? I'm a middle-aged, middle-class white male living in comfortable suburbia in one of the richest countries in the world. So necessarily, the future for me has to involve what some people would call sacrifice because because if we're gonna if we're gonna do that then it, i can't stay where i am and just hope everyone else comes up to here because as we all know from the charts if if, if we get everyone up to my level of diet and consumption then we'd need five planets to do that so that's not going to happen 
So these people need to, um, this is a developing world and this is the you know, developed world, if you like. These people need to be raised out of poverty and have a decent standard of living. And, uh, and we are gonna need to accept some sacrifices. I am gonna need to su- accept some sacrifices in my life to facilitate that. Consume less, I need to, con- I, I, I consume less than I did five years ago, but there's way more than I could do. I'm personally happy to do that, but not everybody has got to that point in their, in their life yet. Um, so my, my future is a bit more, a bit, a bit more sacrifice in, in, in consumption, which I think I can do. And with the, with the, the joy of watching other people coming up to a similar level of living. Perfect. I, um, I can't answer that question for you, but I want you to know that, uh, we, we live in, in a world of abundance and just like the future and innovation, in many respects, some of those things have been around for a long time and have already existed. If we applied them, we would just say, oh my goodness, there's so much abundance and availability here. Um, even though this earth overshoot day, this world of resources, you say if everybody lived like Americans, we'd need five planets worth of resources. Um, That comes from a number. So there's one point, I believe it's eight, seven global hectares per person, which is replicable, which means if we each had that global hectare, we could all live a ripe old age, have enough food, water, Mm. energy, shelter, security to live a ripe old age, as long as we had good stewardship over it and and used it wisely. Um, but per person on this earth, we're using 2.87 or 8.9 global hectares per person, which is this resource overshoot. That means we're using more resources than we have. Mm. A, lot of, a lot of that is if we, um, even though we're all here at the, you know, or not all, uh, there's the developed world that's, uh, I hate to have the inequity to say we're up here living the good life. Uh, is up here, um, if we all lived equitably with, uh, and I believe to have enough food, to have a house, to have all that is available for everyone. If we change one major thing, and that's how not the brands of the future, not the new autonomous flying cars, change how we produce. If we go totally off of um, fossil fuels, and we change how we produce that it doesn't harm human health and our environment in the process, I believe that we can stay within planetary boundaries and through that Mm -hmm. way we produce with renewable energies, with new sustainable innovations, with things that are infinite and they're non-finite resources. Um, One thing that's very negative with, with climate change is it our weather's hotter. There's more moisture or heat Mm -hmm. in the air, which puts more moisture in the air, which makes the storm stronger and more impactful. What if we took that negative thing that's creating all these things and we took all that moisture in the air and we use that as the, the, the ocean that's surrounding us, not just the real ocean. And we did ambient water harvesting or rainwater harvesting, or we found innovative, sustainable ways to take that, which is also a twist on geoengineering, mm. um, which might get us back into that balance to use those waters for our resources to plant, to grow. If instead of producing something that the minute we produced it, 10 seconds later, we throw it in the garbage, yeah. when we were on a planet that there is no throw away, it all remains here. If we found a way to say, the way we produce things doesn't have harm on human health, on the trash environment and and so on, that we find better ways to do that. And and the last way is really that when, when we think about that global hectare, we're only think that number comes from areable land Hmm. that is um, clean and healthy and able to do something. But if we think sustainably and innovative, we can go vertical with that. We could go seasteading with that. We could find other ways to increase that global hectare in another global virtual space that is a whole different system. 
And uh, so I, 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 I really think that some of the messages you've given, the videos you've given, the things you've talked about, that's in there. It's, it's doable. And there yeah. is that possibility of abundance. I am very much a realist. I, I, um, I'm, I'm not a tree hugger environmentalist in that respect. And, and I'm more so a social entrepreneur, or a businessman and, and, and try to do the best and most efficient business operating systems. Um, and I've realized over the years from a standard business model to a resilient or sustainable or ESG business model, mm. it's a much better operating system. You reduce the cost of goods sold, you increase your profits, you are able to pay your employees over time, you have resources, but it's a, a much different business model. It's a platform infrastructure business model that's resilient and um, it, it, it helps people in all different walks of life. And that's kind of the view I take. Um, and the shift I'd like us to see, I've seen it um, in the last five years that all top 10 major corporations in the world have all shifted to a platform business model where ESG is deeply ingrained in that, their model, even if they're a computer company has a food section, a sustainability section, yeah. an energy section that, you know, they are doing the complete system uh, because it's an organization, an organism that's working uh, homogenically or holistically together that really solves these global grand challenges. Mm. Uh, I appreciate you bearing with me with my, my, my answer or my uh, little um, addition to your, what does a world that works for everyone look like for that's you? That's great to hear. Do you have any questions or thoughts or ideas that you want to ask me before I give our last wrap up question? Um, I, I, obviously, I'm, it's very interesting to see how your career is mapped out. And I know you were, you were trained by um, Al Gore initially on the, on his program. And, and, uh, you, and, you know, we talked about the, the Michael Moore film that was released recently and it was a little bugbear for me. And I did a little um, response video to it as well. And one of the things that um, that Michael Moore threw at several people in the climate activism movement, um, uh, including Al Gore, was this this suggestion of somehow profiteering or collusion almost with with the fossil fuel industries to, and that it was all some kind of sham, which is not a, an opinion that I share, and which is what I made very clear in my re response video. Um, but I, I wondered if and I didn't really touch on Al Gore in my response video, really. I was looking more at 350.org. Um, but I wonder if you, you might, it'd be interesting for me, I've never had the first hand opportunity to talk to someone that's been so deeply involved in that organization for you to really, you know, help me understand, I hopefully, why that's not the case and, and, and what your perception of that is. I'd love to. So um, that Michael Moore uh, video, um, your video response to that was eloquent and that's initially how we came into contact and I thank you for clarifying that because I sent that out to everybody in the climate reality project um, because of the very negative things they said about Al Gore and mainly about renewable energy it's just a distorted mm. view the and you mentioned this it was like taking such old footage and then twisting it in the wrong way. Um, there are a lot of bad things about the renewable energy transition and some things that have occurred. So uh, there's, a, there's a stark learning curve and um, Al Gore addressed this, the, especially biofuels and these, um, you know, what's, what's that, how negative that is, even though at one point he was just like, 350.org, um, you know, came out and said, at one point said how great it was and then said, oh, this is not really what it was purported to be. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to be uh, one of the early uh, people to be trained by Al Gore as a climate leader, a speaker, a mentor, and uh, I've, I've taught many people with him along this climate reality project to become a climate leader, which is a three-day course where um, 
basically Al Gore gives his presentation three different ways to give people an education on how to understand the facts, how to present climate issues, and then empowers everyone with his own presentation and, and uh, to become part of the Climate Reality Project to go out and educate and, and spread the word about what's going on in, in this respect with climate change. He, Al Gore, uh, was for a long time a politician, but he's always been very involved in the climate because of a professor he had when he was going to university that was his mentor and inspiration. Um, he, what a lot of people don't know, he's also a vegan and um, up until just recently didn't speak a lot about food and, and agriculture. Um, mm. Because that was going to be one of my questions, he, actually. Yeah, he just wasn't felt he was ready. And also because even though he was vegan, uh, he didn't, didn't always reflect it. But he is also with Generation, one of his companies, an Apple investor, a Tesla investor. He's involved first and foremost. He's uh, a businessman and he does a lot of around sustainable investings and investing in, in our future. Um, the big way where he got a lot of money was Al Jazeera. He used to own the company yeah. Al Jazeera and sold out a big media outlet, which is seen as also very controversial, the type of yeah. things they did and, and that. And so um, one thing that's come up for, for us both uh, recently that we've always had to deal with is that we're not Greta Thunberg. And what I mean by that is Greta Thunberg is not only young, but she's innocent. She, in some respects, she's not a true child, but yes, she's a true child with a little bit of a disability and has that innocence. And she doesn't have the age and the wisdom and the experience of our world because, and, and by all rights, that's fine. Um, but she grasped the message in an early age. Al Gore, you know, used to be a politician and governor, and then he used to, you know, as a businessman. And so there's, yeah. uh, if you want to find something wrong, by all means, you're going to find something yeah, wrong. Yeah, there's baggage there, yeah. He's yeah. had a lot of life, and, and he came from a t uh, his family ranch as a tobacco farm at first, and then went to an Angus cattle, cattle farm. And so, uh, and that was just where he lived and how his family grew up and how it evolved. And and so that's also, so you could say, well, he's talking about food, but he used to be a tobacco farmer and then he's an Angus beef farmer. And, you know, uh, there's so many things where if you want to point a finger or say he's not perfect, you can. The message is, is clear. He's been around at all the conference of the parties, the COP uh, initiatives forever. He's a member of the World Economic Forum and a fabulous voice for for climate change and so um i i think that the uh if you want to cherry pick which jo dr john C cooks talks about in his misinformation sure. cranky uncle book um you can cherry pick and make anybody look bad you can make me look bad because uh, i'm hairy old and i did things before but um that that's not the point the overall message yeah. the general direction the things that he's done for the climate has been absolutely fabulous the people he's trained in the awareness and the amount of money he's put into uh helping us progress to to get a better future is there and it continues and he, he'll mm. i don't think he'll ever give up that fight but he has a lot of baggage just like i do i'm sure like you do as well yeah, I mean, sure. we're, yeah. we're not rosy we don't have that innocence and so it's a little bit harder for someone especially with pre-built in biases or noise uh is just going to look for something wrong and, mm. and they're going to find it because we're mm. fallible non-perfect humans um that brings up something that I want to touch on as well. So I mentioned Greta Thunberg, fabulous. But I want our world to know that there are um, many other youth climate activists that have been around for a long time. Uh, first, uh, well, not the first, but one very big one 
was Severin Suzuki. She spoke in front of the, um, not, it wasn't the COP then, but it was the Rio conference, which is a pinnacle conference for the United Nations. And she spoke in front of the entire General Assembly Congress at the, at the Rio summit and uh, gave a, a very eloquent and hard hitting um, speech to them. And she is still to this date, her and her father, uh, staunch climate activists and have led movements of indigenous peoples and actions around the world. In Germany, there's a Felix Finkbeiner, who's a fabulous climate yep. activist. Yep. He has a, com a, Plan for a planet, organiz organization, Plant for the Planet, planted yeah. almost millions, hundreds of millions mm. of trees already. I think it's in the trillions already of trees and, and so, uh, done these fair trade chocolate bars for every chocolate bar that's bought uh, uh, under fair trade. One tree is planted, all sorts of fabulous things. And he did stop talking, start planning movement within the UN. He has trained more climate leaders to speak about the climate than Al Gore. He's trained 82,000 cl youth climate leaders um, and, you know, planted all sorts of trees, so hard action for the youth. And, and there's many, many more out there I could speak about. Yeah. Greenberg is the rock, the pinnacle. She's moved millions of people and, um, you know, also written a book and done some fabulous things. But this climate issue is not a new thing. And uh, Al Gore, is the proof of that, it's, was around before him. It's been around for a long time. We need to quit talking about it and start acting and making these changes. And yeah. uh, that leads perfectly. I, I don't know if I answered in your, your question. Did I kind of answer it? Yeah, yeah. And it was kind of where I was at anyway, Mark. I mean, I, I've watched a video of Al Gore in Congress in 1985, I think. And the yeah. same year, James Hansen gave his testimony to Congress. Yeah. And you, you're unlikely to see a more passionate and fired up and honest yeah. man who's angry about what he sees before him than, yeah. than that than that video and it's on youtube people can go and find it um and and they'll understand what i mean when they watch it so i don't think i ever had any doubt about the fire in his belly and actually i watched another video from maybe six months ago at the age of what is he 71 72 now yeah. same fire same passion same anger really um i think he was in front of something like the world economic forum yeah um so I, you know that was the man i see uh you know the passion in the man that i see and, and i was just just wanted to hear from you your he, personal you know he's given um, several ted talks he spoke at the world economic forum he's spoken in front of the un he's been doing this a long time and he is passionate but he's also a fallible human i'm sure he has made some investments that uh he thought at one time were very good and then turned out to be not a very good project or a, a step in the right direction and he's quickly learned from those mistakes mm. and pulled back and changed those investments or things he's doing. But uh, there's definitely no ulterior motives or anything in his. Yeah. All his climate reality uh, trainings that he's done are all free to those who attend. You just have to find a way to get there and, and attend. And now they've switched it to an online version and, and it's a really good start to to kind of get the basis to be able to talk about the message i used to be the germany and austria country manager for our country coordinator for his climate reality project and trained numerous climate speakers and leaders how to speak on that and so um there's uh, uh, you know it, it's hard press for me to find too too bad of things there but i do know about mm. his his history and his past and his his reputation and it, it's really beyond uh, approach. So yeah, well, thank you for that. I appreciate that, it. The, that leads me to the, the last question: Is there for our listeners? Is if you could go up to um, every individual in our world individually and one on one, give them Dave's message or one sustainable takeaway that would empower them or change their life or give them your vision of what a key thing to do would be. What, what would that be? What's Dave's message to those, if you had that captive audience to go up to each individual and say, hey, I want to tell you this one thing and hopefully it's affect, it'll affect you like it has affected me. Can I tell you two things very sure. quickly? Tell me, tell me four things. I, I just uh, well, it might to... be three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, com we'll compromise at three. 
Num- number one, confront issues. And as I said earlier, that's the thing I've learned probably more than anything else in my life. James Baldwin, who was uh, the um, civil rights activist um, in the 60s, said, um, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. That really, that, those are words that hit home to me. That's number one, confront issues. Don't shy away from them. They never go away, they just get worse. Confront them now, early, as quickly as possible. Number two, don't, be, don't let success or failure define you. And again, I'll give you another word from another phrase from a poem by Rudyard Kipling in 1909, which he wrote, for, you know the poem, but he wrote it for his son. It's called If, and he wrote it as a synopsis for his son, and it could have been his daughter, it doesn't matter about gender. And it's the one that starts if you can keep your head while all those around you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. In the middle of that poem, it says, if you can meet with triumph and disaster, and treat those two imposters just the same. And those are, again, very powerful words for me. We, we, we tend to oscillate too much in life. We get a bit too happy when we get a success and a bit too down when we get a failure. And those two things are necessary in life. The line is here. And the trick is to, is to not get too, don't dwell on the successes too much because next week you might have one of these. It doesn't matter. It's all part of life. And, and that's a massive lesson I've learned. So. And social media and the internet are very good at telling people they've always got to be up here and you're absolutely absolutely useless and failure and worthless if you're down here. And this is where I think a lot of mental health problems stem from, particularly in our younger generations. So that lesson there, don't, don't be guided, don't be defined by success or failure. You will have both in your lifetime. And then I suppose the third one, just very quickly, is show empathy. You know, just think about things from someone else's point of view. If you're about to rant at someone in road rage, just think about how their day might be going. Their dad might have died or their kids might be sick or something. So my mum taught me that. Just just have a bit more empathy for others. That's there you go. Beautiful. Thank you. I agree with that. And I also adhere to a similar wisdom. You know, the golden rule, treat people and planet the way you would like to be treated and exactly. let's leave this planet better than we found it, one yeah. for multiple generations to come, whether we have children or not. I, um, in, in your last video on the SDGs, you had a couple of books on, this, on the desk behind you, as you usually always do. It was Vaclav Smil's growth book. Um, which I haven't I read that yet. <laughs> and Vaclav, the other one is Vaclav Smil, uh, Energy uh, and Civilization, yeah. which um, talks so much about, uh, you know, it's a book on energy. And do you know what the first half of it is? Is nothing but agriculture, food and beverages, seafood, because um, no matter how far we've distanced ourselves from from food, it is our main energy source. It's yeah. not renewable energy. It's that is our source of battery power. Food is our energy, our caloric intake. It what regulates our body temperature, and it's the only thing that during this pandemic um, did not get put on lockdown. It uh, still mm. traveled over nations and borders, and um, saw lots of things occur. And so with that, I, I um, hope to see many more books behind you <laughs> during your videos. And I know you'll always bring us wise wisdom and super critical thinking things. I haven't seen one video, even in the beginnings that, I, that disappointed. And so oh, I thank you. you for your stewardship and what you're bringing to the, the a world of educating people and empowering them with more knowledge to change our futures. Dave, thank you so much. And I look forward to maybe speaking to you again in the future, and maybe we can collaborate some way. That'd be great. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dave.